but then there was an issue um, for me to get the video to work on a blackboard. So, okay, what I've done instead is I have handwritten uh, lecture notes, which I hope are okay. Um, and again, if something, I mean, if something is not clear, please interrupt me at any time. I do not mind at all, okay? So what is the plan for the lectures? Roughly speaking, I decided to cover not too much um, because I believe if somebody is not working on a particular topic uh, and you actually want to learn it, it's much better to have something more simple and condensed, which is also basic, but still nonetheless touches upon the most recent advances in the Swampland program. Okay, so I think, or my hope is that whatever I present are calculations which can easily be done like, you know, it should never take too much time in case you want to check some of the statements that I'm making, all right? So the first lecture, I will repeat some of the basic ingredients in flux compactifications. I hope I get to the CETER no goals. In lecture two, I make a connection to the Swampland program. And I also go from the CITER to anti the CITER. Uh, because it's one of, I think, the most recent exciting developments in the Swamp Plan program is that there are things about anti sitter space, which we have not been thinking about very carefully, and they completely changes our view on string phenomenology. And in the third lecture, I will continue on this. It brings us to what is called the ADS distance conjecture. And then I might describe, if time, more recent things, uh, which are more advanced, so it's not any more basic flux compactifications like the KKLT scenario, and its links with the Swamp Plan program. If I don't get there, I don't think that is a problem too much. So only for those people that feel like you know you, you want to get a little bit more involved, I included exercises, and you can always get back to me in case something is not working or you don't. If you want to make them, uh, yeah, if there is a problem with them. Okay, good. So let me start lecture one. Um, what, is, what is important for me here? What is the main goal that I would like to pursue or the message I would like to convey is that we know that string theory is not the same as supergravity, okay? But supergravity in 10 dimensions or in 11 dimensions is at least a computable corner or a limit of string and empty theory. And the mental picture to have in mind is this one, okay? This is a graph. The vertical axis is the inverse string coupling. So if I go to infinity, if I go very much up, I'm going to the weakly coupled sector of string theory. And what is the, the horizontal axis? This is any length scale you can think of in my space-time background. So this could be the volume of an internal manifold of a compact dimension. It could also be a gradient of some fields, anything with which you can associate a length scale. If I divide this length scale by the string length, I, I call it L over LS. This is a dimensionless number, just like the string coupling. What I'm trying to say is that in the parametric limit, 10 dimensional supergravity becomes, string theory becomes the same as 10 dimensional supergravity. What is interesting and why is the link there with the Swamp Plan program is that the Swamp Plan program, a lot about the Swamp Plan program is telling us what, how do we approach this limit and what happens in this limit, a little bit also before. So what you will see in my lectures is that computationally I decided to stick completely to 10 dimensional supergravity. So these are the only tools involved. Um, and then we're gonna to try to see what we learned from supergravity and how it nicely rhymes with Swamp Plan's criteria. And th this is sort of the plan, okay? And so symbolically more in a symbolic equation, this is a purely symbolic equation, don't take it too serious. What I'm trying to say is that string theory in the parametric regime equals supergravity plus loop corrections which go like powers, positive powers in the string coupling constant times some coefficient, which we don't always know. There can also be non-perturbative corrections, which go like e to the minus one over gs, 
also to this is also goes to some power. And the same happens for these dimensionless quantities. So I have what we call derivative corrections to supergravity. They would be suppressed by LS over L. And similarly, we can have non-perturbative corrections in those, in those numbers, okay? So clearly when I'm here, I can sort of restrict to supergravity. And a lot of the swampland is trying to understand what happens here. Okay, it's highly non-trivial uh, task. Good. So what I said for the lectures, little string theory knowledge is required. So we will not be using world sheet techniques, almost no holography. Uh, but interestingly, through string dualities, often when you say something about what you think is tree level, is actually very quantum in a dual frame. That, that's very nice about string theory, okay? So I'm gonna do a very quick warm up. I, I think many people might know this, but also when I learn something, I really like to stick to the basics and again, go from there. So I quickly wanna review front rubin vacua uh, because it's front rubin vacua are very important in the context of, of the swamp plant program. And then I get more involved and I, I come to the you know, state of the art on, on flux complexifications, okay? So what are front rubin vacua? Let's not yet do string theory or supergravity. Let's just say we, had, we have a theory of B capital D plus small d dimensions. And this theory is Einstein Hilbert gravity given by this action coupled to a D form field strength. So little d of, you know, this should be the extra dimensions is exactly matching the rank of a field strength that is present. Okay, this is our theory, it's quite simple. And we're gonna look for solutions which have the following form, the space time factors in a non-compact part which is D-dimensional uh, non-compact space with capital D. And then there is a compact manifold of dimension little d. Okay, so what can I do to preserve the symmetries? Assuming this is a maximally symmetric space, ADS, the Sitter, Minkowski, because I'm looking at the vacuum of my theory. One of the answers that you can write down for the P-form is just saying, well, the P-form is proportional to the volume form living on this compact manifold. And the constant of proportionality, I call it Q, okay? What does it mean? That it um, just means in practice that if I integrate this epsilon, I get the volume of my compact manifold, okay? This statement that this is how space-time factors at the level of the metric, it means that we write the following metric without of diagonal components, Again, because I'm in the vacuum, if there would be a Kaluza Klein vector, I truncate it and I'm, you know, so the metric becomes very simple in the vacuum. And then Greek indices mu nu, they are no compact space and Greek indices alpha beta gamma, they are the indices in my compact space. So once you write a form, sorry, you write an ansatz, you should check whether you are fulfilling the equations of motion. So one has to check whether df equals zero, this is trivially true because this is a volume form. And one should check whether D star of F is zero. This is also trivially true because the star of this guy would be the volume form on this space, which is also closed. So the form equations of motion are okay. So what about the Einstein equations? Here is the Einstein equation for a D form in D plus D dimensions. So, you know, you have all these little details which if you have, you know, it's a nice exercise if you've never computed the energy momentum tensor and trace reverse Einstein equations to, to reproduce this. So I have a term which is a square of the D form and then I have the metric here. And then I have a square of this form, but one, two indices are not contracted, A and B. So the two free indices are A, B and A, B here, right? So if I wanna compute the Einstein equations, I have to fill in this answer. My apologies, I have to fill in this answer. And what you can find on the formula sheet, which I shared on the chat box, is I, I have all the little details of how to get everything correct, especially the numerical factors, the minus signs, which can be a, a bit of a headache sometimes if you've never done these kind of calculations. And with the specific answers I've given, F squared is simply a constant. And F squared AB, that means this guy, is proportional to the metric on the internal manifold. So what is nice, you see that indeed the Einstein equations are telling us that everything is proportional to the metric itself. 
So the, the full higher dimensional space time splits into two factors, which are both what we call Einstein manifolds, meaning that their Ricci tensors are proportional to their metrics. So if you work that out, you see that the Einstein equation in a non-compact dimension has a negative sign in front of the metric. So this is an ADS space, ADSD. But as the Einstein equation or the trace reverse Einstein equation, this we call trace reverse the moment you write, not the Einstein tensor, but the Ricci tensor, you have a positive number. So you can think of this maybe as a sphere, a sphere like a D sphere would be a good example of a space that fulfills this condition, okay? Immediately already, I'm gonna to touch upon the first swamp plants uh, conjecture, which I will explain in much greater detail later. For such simple solutions, what do we notice? Well, there's an important physical observable, which is a curvature scale, which for very simple space times, the curvature scale is in fact related to the volume. So the, so the curvature radius would be essentially the same as the volume radius, okay? And what do we see? So the way I introduce the curvature or the length scales, a cosmological constant like this, I would call minus one over lambda squared ADS. So we call this the ADS length. And the curvature scale of the sphere, I would call one over L squared S, S of sphere. And what do we see? We see that the ratio of these two curvature scales or curvature radii or volume radii is order one. What does that mean? If we put an observer in this space time, that observer will not say that space time is compactified because the size of the ADS space, the Hubble scale of the universe, is of the same size as the compact dimension. So, such an observer would see all, you know, 10 dimensions if we are in 10 dimensional supergravity. Okay, so this is not good for phenomenology. For phenomenology, you want to be able to hide your extra dimensions. Well, one of the two or three swampland conjectures we will see is extremely far reaching. It's in fact a conjecture which is telling us that this always happens, always. Imagine this swampland conjecture is correct. We have to completely rethink the way we relate string theory to our observable world. You could say we don't live in ADS space, I agree. We don't live in ADS space, but ADS space is often the starting ground to build phenomenological compactifications. Okay. So it would be very far reaching. A technical note I want to quickly make. We have to be careful with my notation here. What I have done in this symbol Q, the way I wrote it, I mean, there are many ways to write the flux ansatz. It's convention. And I will change conventions just for you to get used to different conventions. Here, I took the volume form on this space. Most papers would write the normalized volume form on this space, okay? And the, okay, what, does, what is the difference? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that this number Q, if this number Q, it relates to, uh, I mean, there's a, okay, now I'm mumbling, let me try to make an exact statement here. When you quantize the flux, that is what I'm trying to explain. You have to be careful whether your conventions are such that this epsilon is a normalized epsilon or not. Maybe that's the only point I'm trying to make, okay? Um, so how do you, okay, so let me go back to my first slide. How do I know I found actually a good solution? I mean, okay, I solved the equations of motion, but what do I do to get myself in the regime where I would trust this solution? I need to make sure all the length scales are large enough, right? And this is where it gets confusing. This means that this Q has to be a very small number. You could say that is weird because I'm used to the fact that if I want to have a large space, I need to crank up the flux quantum. And that is true. And that is a confusion I wanted to tell you. Okay. There is a hidden volume factor there. So I can choose my flux quantum. I can let it go to infinity consistently. And okay, this should be a minus one. The volume grows at a larger rate so that this number actually goes to zero. We, I will later make this very explicit. I just use very awkward conventions, but for a moment you have to trust me that if I quantize this correctly, small Q actually corresponds to large flux quantum. Okay, we will do these things much more carefully. All right. 
So I want to show you already here, we can make contact with one of the simplest and most far reaching swamp plant conjecture that I know of, which is the ADS conjecture, and we will get more in the details of this. Also, it's not often told, especially to students, how should you conceptually think of this vacuum? Why is there a vacuum? There is a very simple physical picture, okay? In relativity, in general relativity, whenever I have a sphere, spherical space-time, a spherical space-time want to collapse under its own weight, okay? So gravity works such that a, that a sphere wants to collapse. So why, why do I have evolution? Well, we have put magnetic field lines inside that sphere. And magnetic field lines don't like to be squeezed. If you squeeze them, it costs you a lot of energy. So we have two competing forces. We have gravity that wants to make the sphere collapse. And we have magnetic fields that want to keep the sphere open. And these two forces balance out. And this is why we have a solution. OK. Instead of doing dimensional, instead of working directly with the higher dimensional equations of motion, it is more conventional to use dimensional reduction techniques. And what I will do is I will do this in using what we know canonical frames and normalized scalars. What do I mean? So I'm going to again rederive the solution, but in a different way. And I do it as follows I write my higher dimensional space time metric in the following block diagonal way. And now there is a number, there's a scalar field, curly phi. And curly phi is a scalar field on the non compact space. Whereas the numbers alpha and beta, they're numerical constants, which we will fix soon. And in this convention, the compact space, this metric has unit volume. This means that all of the degrees of freedom of the volume are sitting in this scalar field. So this scalar field we call the radion or the volume scalar, all right? And so the, the volume of an internal space becomes in fact a scalar field in lower dimension, all right? So what you can do now is you can just take these ansatz and reduce the action, Einstein-Hilbert action. What do you get? Well, I'm claiming what you should try to get is this. You have Einstein gravity coupled to a canonical scalar, and there is a potential term, which I will come to very, very quick. Well, you see, if what I need to do to get this, I need to fine tune this number beta in terms of this number alpha. And the relation between the two is the following. So remember, capital D is the dimension of non compact space time, and little d is the dimension of compact space time. So when that is true, there is no scalar field in front of the Einstein Hilbert term. That is the trick. Okay. This is means we say we go to d dimensional Einstein frame. That's how we phrase it. All right. I mean, it is okay if you want to do the compactification with alpha and beta different. There's no problem. But then you would still have to do a field redefinition in order to find lower dimensional Einstein Hilbert gravity. Okay. Another thing you need to do is you need to find uh, the overall value of the numbers. So here I say these two numbers are related, but then this number has to be very specific to get actually a canonical normalized kinetic term. I, you know, this is an exercise to calculate it. I can always give you the answer. But in fact, for what we are doing, it's not so important because I'm not going to use the fact that my scalar field is canonically normalized. Okay. The physics is here. Right, so let me explain this notation. This is the exponential of two alpha minus beta phi. And what is R tilde D? That is the Ricci scalar of this unit volume space. So it's either positive or negative of Z or zero, but when it's say, let, let us take it to be positive. And if you would analyze this, what do you have? You have an, ex an exponential potential. So what does an exponential potential do? It makes the field want to run away. If you check, the details of these numbers, you see it's exactly what I said before. If it's a sphere, it wants to collapse because you roll down the exponential. If this would be a hyperboloid, so it's a negative number, the space wants to explode. Okay. Right, so I clearly need another force to stabilize the volume, and this is where my fluxes enter the game. Right. So don't forget in my higher dimensional action. I had this p form. And if I dimensionally reduce it, I get this term. Okay, so what, what do I find? This is very interesting. This is again an exponential, but the numbers of the exponential are different. And it is run away in a different direction. 
<coughs> right? So what I'm trying to say is this, if you write down the full theory of the, well, the full theory, this is only the theory in which I let the scalar field, the volume fluctuate, then I have a very simple potential of two terms. So if, if I take a sphere geometry, then I have negative energy due to the curvature and I have positive energy due to the fluxes. And you will actually see that you can stabilize, you can find a critical point to this effective potential. And this critical point is exactly my ADS cross sphere vector. Okay. So that's what I said. Stabilizing this, just solving this equation, exactly reproduces the dimension, the solution we found from higher dimensional point of view. So that's also a nice exercise to check this. Okay. All right. So this was a warm up, and now I go to the more serious stuff. What does it mean? That I will consider compactifications of type 2A and type 2B supergravity. Why type 2? Well, for the sake of moduli stabilization, uh, type 2 is considered sort of the best because there are many fluxes you can play with. And you don't have that in the heterotic string or the type 1 string. You have less fluxes to play with, all right? So from now on, I fix the dimension of the higher dimensional space to be 10. And aside the volume scalar, we for sure have one scalar that will always be around, and that is the string coupling, the dilaton scalar. All right. And as I said, we have multiple fluxes. And let me remind you that in type 2A, string theory, the fluxes, they are even rank field strength. So they are F0. That's just a scale. That's just a number. There is F2, like the Maxwell field strength. There's an F4, an F6, an F8, and an F10. But be careful, they're not independent. Okay, This is what sometimes some people call the democratic formulation. So there is a link between them. I mean, F8 is nothing but a star of F2. And F6 is nothing but the star of F4. All right, keep that in mind. Similarly, in type 2B, we have all the odd rank field strengths, we have F1, F3, F5, F7, and F9. And also we have the duality relation between them. So you shouldn't overcount degrees of freedom. What is tricky though, is that F5 is self-dual, right? So just plug in five here and you see that F5 is by construction or by definition, a self-dual field, all right? Ah, yeah. Keep in mind this relation, there's no dilaton here. So this relation is true in 10 dimensional string frame. What do I mean with 10 dimensional string frame? It means that in front of the Einstein Hilbert term, there's an e to the minus two phi r, right? Okay. So why do I show this, what we call a democratic formulation? Because from now on, I will, my claim is that it's much simpler to do calculations. Um, with only magnetic fluxes. Okay, what is the name magnetic versus electric flux? So electric flux means that some of these field strengths have feet inside the four dimensional space time. Just like electric flux of the Maxwell field means that I have a foot a long time. So for general fluxes in string theory, we say whenever we have feet inside you know, the four dimensional space time, which of course includes time, we call it electric and otherwise we call it magnetic. What you can always do Imagine that I, okay, let me just make it very explicit. There is type 2A and I have F4. What if I say, okay, F4 is pointing in all four non-compact dimensions. I can equally describe this as an F6 that is pointing inside the compact dimensions. Now, what is nice about using the last one and not the first one, so why using F6, is that I can just fill it in in the action and there's no problem. So this is a technical detail which you can forget. I'm just trying to say that if we, if we use a convention that whenever there's an electric flux, we Hodge dualize it and we describe it as magnetic flux, computations are simpler. And they're like a bit like I just did for Frank Rubin. Okay. Okay, there's one more thing I need to say about these fluxes. They need to obey equations of motion. And what is beautiful about type two string theory is that they obey general equations, which are easy to remember. They can look very complicated, but not when you write them correctly. So the way I think about them is just these two equations and all the rest are details. So when it's zero and one, the field strengths are closed. 
So this is what we call a bank identity. It's not an equation of motion. When n is bigger than one, it's like this. Dfn equals h3 wedge fn minus two. So you should, you should check, this is an n plus one form. This is an n plus one form. So who is h3? That's my notation for the Navier-Schwarz Navier -Schwarz flux in string theory. That's a three-form field coming from a two-form gauge potential, which is the universal gauge potential that couples to the string of string theory. Okay, so I, what I like about type two is that you only need to remember these two equations. In fact, you only need to remember this one because you see that when, F, when n is one or two, yeah, you cannot even write down this form. Okay, so in that sense, there's only one equation. You could say no, because these are Bianchi identities. These are not equations of motion. Well, as long as you remember this formula, you also have all equations of motion. All right, and then there is one more equation of motion that you need to know for this never schwartz never schwartz field strength, and that is a longer one. It obeys at the star, and here is a dilaton factor in string frame e to the minus two phi h three equals minus one over two, and then the sum over all fluxes star f n which f n. Okay, this is it. This specifies all flux equations of motion. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you general formula for dimensional reduction. Um, and I'm going to explain how constructing an effective action relates to working with the 10 dimensional equations of motion. This is very neat. And this is used in a lot of the swampland literature, say on the sitter space, okay? And most of my lectures are just at this level. And this is what I like. So the only thing, if you, if you just try to follow this, and technically, I think we are fully equipped for the rest of the lectures. OK. So what I'm going to talk about is explaining in the appendix of this paper uh, on the archive. All right. So the 10-dimensional bosonic action. And now I'm on purpose changing, again, frames, because I think it's very useful to be able to, you know, to, to work with Einstein versus string frame. It's good that you know you get used to this. So this is a part of the bosonic action of type 2b and type 2a string theory or supergravity in 10 dimensions. Uh, and I'm exactly writing the part that is uh, that I need for making my statements. Okay, so this is not the full answer yet. For instance, there are localized contributions to the action, which are, for instance, D brains. Orientifold planes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So please note my notation. We see the Einstein Hilbert term, we see the dilaton, we see the Neve Schwarz, Neve Schwarz field, and we see there are more and more uh, fluxes. And in Einstein frame, the dilaton factors are e to the minus phi for the NS and S field. And I call them a n phi for the Ramon-Ramon fields, and the general formula is this. A n is five minus n over two. And as I said, I will stop working democratically so that I will not have all the fluxes involved. I will only use magnetic fluxes. And as I also said, be careful in type 2b, because then this is strictly speaking incorrect. Okay, it's very confusing to people. In fact, type 2b, you cannot write the action like that, and it's very easy to see. And the only problem is in the five form. If star f equal f for a five form, then f squared equals zero, so the term would not even be in the action. So therefore, I will often relate to the equations of motion and not to the action, okay? Good, I need the final ingredient that we will need are the localized objects. And that, that is where the, I would say, this is really, for me, the real string theory input. Because you could say, good, this is still supergravity, but the moment you work with localized objects, which are sort of, well, extended objects like black holes, but then with multiple dimensions, black brains, that is very string theory input because they're singular sources. And in, an, you know, in GR, you would typically not Think about them in the way we will do here. Okay. So, what I, I will specifically restrict myself to D brains and orientifold planes. They can have a very complicated action 
describing these singular objects, but I almost need no details, at least unless I will go to KKLT, we'll see whether we get there, then I need details. For the moment, it is enough to recall ourselves a DBI action, which means that an object has a tension, and then the tension is multiplied with the space-time volume of the object. So this is the induced metric, the determinant of the induced metric on the brain or the oriented object. Then there is a coupling to the gauge field. So there is an P here. What does P mean? Well, P comes from DP or OP. So P, you know, in type 2A, I would be discussing, you know, uh, D1 brains. Okay, there's something called D minus one. Let me not go there. There's D1, D3, D5, D7, and D9. So P would range from say one to nine. Um, and this is the gauge field that couples to that brain, right? So the gauge field is P plus one dimensional in rank. So you can nicely integrate it over the world volume of a DP brain because it has P plus one space and dimensions. The field strength associated to this thing is exactly what I called F before. So the formula is something like F is D of C, but not quite. Because you see, I need to obey this by entry identity. So F is typically something like, let, let me do just a few examples so you get used to it. Like F2 is DC1 plus F0 B2. Why? Let us check this. Let's take the D of this guy. Then this drops out because D of D equals zero. This is a constant, so D doesn't act on it. So I get F0 times D of B. D of B, we have called H3. So indeed I get DF2 equals H3 which F0, okay? And it works like that for all the other uh, field strengths. Okay, these are technical details, but I think we now have all of them. So here you see tension and here you see charge. I have not been careful with my dimensions, everything is string units. So these are all sort of, you know, order one numbers. And what counts for us are only two observations. When the tension is greater than zero, this is how we think of D-brains, they're objects with positive tension. And bizarrely enough, string theory allows objects with negative tension. This would be like negative mass particles. You would say that is inconsistent. It's a bit tricky because these particles are not dynamical in the perturbative limit. Um, and well, I will come back to them, but these are the, the orientifold planes. So I've been told that last week you had a school on, on on fluxes and moduli stabilization. So I assume these things might have passed. You have seen them maybe a little bit last week. Um, just remember that in string theory, there are objects with negative tension and they obey this action. And these objects, we call them BPS. And what does BPS mean? It means that the tension and the charge are essentially equal to each other up to a sign. And of course, there's a Dilaton factor. If you want to understand the physics in this equation, I mean, this comes from a string theory calculation. But the physics in this equation is trivial. It means if I take two D brains, they have positive tension, they will gravitationally attract each other, two positive mass objects, but they will have the same charge. So they will gravitationally, uh, they will electromagnet electromagnetically repel each other. And since this equality holds, they are in balance. The attractive force is as big as a repulsive force. And for orientifold planes is exactly the other. Well, you know, it's the same story for orientifold planes. Yeah, good. All right, so I think I put all of the technical things on the table and now we can do some sample calculations, which will hopefully guide us very quickly to some famous uh, swamp line conjectures. Okay. So uh, since I will sorry, be looking- I have a question. Yeah. Of course. Uh, for non-trivial uh, round round field, isn't there a, an extra term for uh, churn simon action for the brain? Absolutely, it's a very good question. So that's what I said here. So here I should ask and more. I should add the, uh, for instance, the, the churn simons terms for the field strengths. And one way to understand them is that if you would derive equations of motion by a variation here, and I want to, get to these equations, I need to add some Simon's terms. Absolutely. The same for a D-brain. 
So for the D brains, this term we call Vesumino term, but it's much more complicated. Okay, there are extra fluxes that I can add here, that I should add here, and extra fluxes that I should add here. So please think of this as a truncation of the full story, but interestingly, you can actually verify in case you know more that what I'm saying is consistent. Uh, dropping all of these terms for me is consistent in the story I'm presenting. So it's a good exercise to try to understand why this is the case. All right, but it's a very good question. Yes, and I agree with you. So since I will be looking at vacuum equations, sorry, at vacuum solutions, I'm interested in equations of motion where the dilaton is constant because in a vacuum, a scalar is constant. Okay, that's my simplification. And what I'm gonna do now in the coming three slides is that I will do something, well, you could say it's rather basic, but it's important to, to get the logic straight. I will look at the equations of motion that come from this action when I insist on having a vacuum. And then I will relate these equations of motion to the equations of motion you get from an effective action. And I will see there's an almost one-to-one -one match. And once we have proven that there's a one-to-one -one match, we will continue working with effective potentials and go to the swampland conjectures. I hope the, the storyline is roughly clear. Okay, good. So let us start. If I take this action and I do a variation with respect to the dilaton phi, then I have some, I, I, I might have made a mistake, so it's good to check, but there also the, the equations without mistakes are in the notes that I've sent you. Um, so this is my equation, box phi equals zero because phi is constant. And it equals this combination of fluxes. And the most complicated thing here, so you see the nervous Schwartz, Ramon Ramon flux. And this is the most complicated bit. And what is this? This comes from doing a variation of the localized brain action. Since the brain lives on a hypersurface, there's a delta function here, right? Because this is a local insertion in the action. Uh, so this, there's, this is almost everywhere zero unless you're on the brain. Okay, good. But this is annoying. So what I will do is I will coarse grain. I will not use all of the information in this equation. I will use this equation integrated over the compact manifold, right? So I would actually, if I do that, I would even allow phi to be non-constant over the compact manifold. That is actually fine in a vacuum. My dilaton can be running inside the extra dimensions that an observer would not see that. To an observer, as long as the 4D part of the dilaton is constant, you call it a vacuum. So, I, I did not have to do this because the moment I integrate, this is a total derivative on a space without boundary, the left-hand side would vanish, right? So this is an important equation. I integrate this over the compact manifold, which is the, the you know, G6 is the metric. So this is the determinant of the metric. I get this constraint, okay? This is a very important constraint equation. And you see, I integrated away the delta function, all right? I was a little bit careless here. I should probably put a volume factor of, of you know, the D brain, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, this is enough for what we're doing. All right, what about the Einstein equations? The form equations I will not treat because I'm assuming that all the fluxes we are putting are solving the form equations of motion, just like we did with Thron Fubi. But of course, we need to check, and this is important. In an actual example, you need to check. Okay, so here are the trace reverse Einstein equations. I hope I got all my you know, factors of n correct. I invite you to check it. And these are the Ramon Ramon fluxes. There's a similar expression for the Nevers Schwartz Nevers Schwartz flux, which I'm not copying. You just put n equal three here and you put a equal minus one. Okay, and then you have the same expression. And again, the most complicated bit is what you get out of the localized sources. So I just summarize this in a very quick notation. I called it the localized energy momentum tensor T. So it's T log AB. And when I just write T log without the indices, it means a trace over that tensor. Okay, so this is the contribution that I have. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, what is this localized energy momentum tensor? 
That's also a really annoying to derive. At least it has a very simple expression along the four dimensions, four non-compact direct dimensions. So I'm assuming that my brains are filling four-dimensional non-compact space. Otherwise, I would not be in a vacuum. And they're wrapping some sub-manifold inside the extra dimensions. All right. So then these are the uh, these are the equations along the four dimensions. Okay, here i, j are the indices along the internal manifold, and there it is a little bit more complicated. So this is my energy momentum tensor, and all of the complications are put into the symbol pi. What is pi here? I will never need the details of this at this point, but pi, you should think of it as the projector operator on the submanifold that the brain is wrapping. So it's some geometrical object, and the you can roughly think of it, if you like, as a metric on that submanifold. Okay? It's not so important, in fact. We, again, we almost need no details of this. All right, good. And the reason I don't care too much about the details, again, I will look at the integrated equations to make my life simple. Not only will I integrate, I will also contract all the indices over the compact and the non-compact space. Okay, which is nice because it means that I can forget about delta functions. Um, and you can also show that in the simplest cases, this annoying projector operator just becomes P minus three over six times the metric um, on the internal space. In the simple, it's not always the case. Um, I invite you to look into some papers that actually, not, there are almost no papers out there that do the details of this. Okay, so it's difficult to find. If you ever need it, I can point you to some papers, all right? Good, so once we do that, this annoying equation, we, we threw away a lot of information by tracing indices and by integrating. And once you do that, this is the equation you get. So what do we see? We see the six dimensional curvature. We see a combination of Ramon-Ramon field strengths, the same for the NSNS. And we see the localized, the trace of the energy momentum tensor of the localized sources. Okay, good. What have I done? I derived for you two equations, which are coarse grained equation. It means that I'm integrating over the internal manifold and think about it physically. The internal manifold is supposed to be small. So what do we in physics, we do with very small effects. Well, we integrate them away in, a, in, you know, in an effective field theory sense. And in practice, it literally means integrate, all right? So I have this equation, I had um, this equation here, and I will now relate them to uh, minimalizations of an effective potential. That is what I will do now, okay? But before I do that, you should ask you about what is the effective potential after my flux compactification? Well, interestingly, I can also look at that from the point of view of the Einstein equations with ND. Because which Einstein equation I have used? Well, I have used the Einstein equation so far with internal indices ij. I did not use the Einstein equation along non-compact space time with indices mu nu. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna look at not the trace reverse. It turns out to be much more useful to do the ordinary Einstein equation in the non-compact directions. So this is it. So again, there's a sum over my Ramon Ramon fluxes. I have the square of the flux with free in this mu nu. Here I have the total square and the metric. And I have a similar expression for the H flux. And finally, here is the energy momentum tensor of the D brain. You remember that I said that I wanted to work only magnetically? That means that the flux doesn't have indices along 4D space time. And that is useful because then this term goes away. OK. Now, what shall I do with this equation? I'm going to trace it over the 4D indices. And again, I integrate the equation over the internal manifold so that I only get an equation in terms of 4D coordinates. And this equation, how do I interpret it? This is the neat trick. Well, this equation, if I you know, trace it, it would lead me, what is it, to twice, I guess, twice the Ricci tensor, or like a numerical factor times the Ricci scalar. And as you know, the Ricci scalar is just equal to twice the cosmological constant. 
And the cosmological constant is nothing but the same as the on-shell value of an effective potential in a vacuum, correct? So here I read off my, what I think is my on-shell potential, but it turns out to be the full potential. So we should get bi-dimensional deduction. So what I, the way I'm gonna write it from now on is that my potential is the potential that comes from the curvature, the potential from the ramora mock boxes, which I've called Vn, where N labels the rank of the ramora mock box, and the potential that comes from the sources, the d brain story antifalls. Right, so this is literally, I mean, if I would do a compactification of an action by integrating over the extra dimensions, these are really the energy densities that I find in four dimensions. Okay, so I would get this energy density. You remember in the freud rubin case, it was for instance saying that when this internal uh, space is a sphere, it wants to collapse. How do I see that? If a sphere collapses, R gets huge, but R is positive. There's a minus sign here. So indeed I lower the, the energy to arbitrarily negative values. Okay, these are the flux energy densities. And this is the energy density in the sources, right? Good. I have, let me see, nine more minutes. And that is perfect because then I can nicely finish all of the things I, I you know. So I put a lot of technical things on the table, which is, let, let me, you know, summarize this. I've been playing with the type two equations of motion. And I looked at three equations of motion. You remember? One was the integrated Dilaton equation of motion, which gave me this constraint. The other, was, the other one was the internal Einstein equation, trace reverse. That means that you start with writing R and then there's a left hand, right hand side, which I also here trace over the internal indices and I integrated over the internal space to lose information, to make life simple. Finally, I looked at the equation of motion inside the four non-compact dimensions, the Einstein equation. And also there I traced the indices and I integrated over the 6D space, not the 4D space, the 6D space. What did I get? From the last equation, I get the definition of the potential, which indeed is exactly what I get from dimensional reduction. And now the question you should ask, okay, how do I produce the other two equations? What do I do with this potential to get those equations? That is what I wanna show you. And then the first lecture will be done. If I correctly understood that the lecture was one hour. Um, yeah, okay. So I will now show that these equations, you know, which we I talked about are identical to demanding that this effective potential has a zero gradient with respect to the dilaton and a zero gradient with respect to the volume scalar, right? Good. This is what I just, all the blah, blah, I just said. And why do I do that? Why this kind, why specifically this calculation? Because a full compactification of string theory is much more complicated. Well, surprisingly, I mean, this shows, I think a, a typical feature of, of researchers. We, we get in so many complicated details that we forget the basics. So the lessons we can learn from just looking at volume and dilaton are things that you know people only discovered much much later after I've done you know years of highly complicated computations, and it turned out that the simplest things were lying in just these constraints that I just showed you. Okay, so what I'm trying to say, like the full effective field theory, is something like this in the vacuum. So in the vacuum, there are no fermions, there are no vectors, there are only potentially scalars that determine the vacuum. They have some highly non-trivial kinetic term, and there's a potential, and the vacuum would be defined by you know extremizing the potential energy, and then asking that it's metastable. At least this is a formula in Minkowski and the Citrus space. So the, the spectrum of the Hessian has to be positive. Okay. So before I derive, at least so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take just a derivative of V with respect to the dilaton and the volume. But before I do so, I just wanna have a few more comments. Okay. So in general, one expects a link between these equations and 10 dimensional equations of motion. That, that is true. But this link will always involve integrated equations of motion. So they're not one-to-one. -one. And that is because we are coarse grained in the Wilsonian sense. Okay, so what is he saying in more technical ter terms, which I think you might have seen last week, it's conventionally called Kaluza Klein reduction. I take some, so phi is here just a symbol for any field living in 10 space-time dimensions. 
X means an index in 40 and Y is an index in 60. So any 10 dimensional field I can decompose in this way. There's a zero mode, which only depends on X. And then since I have a compact internal space, I can uh, expand the function in terms of uh, say eigen functions of the Laplacian. Let me call them Fn of Y. And then the factors in front are again scalar fields. And whenever N is bigger, larger than zero, you can show these scalar fields are very massive, okay? So we call them KK modes. And the question is, are they very heavy? And a dimensional reduction, if you talk to a mathematician, they will say, well, a dimensional reduction is consistent in a mathematical sense. When the heavy modes, this is a symbolic equation, right? So, so there is a box of phi. It's not sourced by a light mode. It's not sourced by this guy. Okay, so in another way of writing, what you, what you don't want symbolically is something like box phi n goes like phi zero. Because if that is true, I cannot put the heavy modes to zero. That is what the mathematician, mathematician would ask. A physicist says, no, I don't care. I can throw away the heavy modes, even if there is an equation like this, on the condition that they're actually heavy. Then I can ignore them as a physicist because they will not contribute in any physical process at all energies. So there's a difference there between mathematical consistency and physical consistency. Keep that, keep that in mind, okay? Almost all reductions in string theory are inconsistent in this sense. Famously, reductions over the Calabiao are inconsistent in this mathematical sense. So what I have to do is I have to make sure that the internal dimension is small. And interestingly enough, this is where the swamp plan is playing a game with us and it's telling us that maybe that is not possible, okay? So that's the end of my comment. In the remaining, well, maybe I shouldn't squeeze that um, in here. Maybe I can ask the organizer whether um, I should keep it for next time, or otherwise I might be throwing too, many, too much information. Yes, um, or, yeah. Part five minutes late, if um, you want, um, you can. Okay. Okay, I will do that, thank you. Yeah. So this discussion of what I'm having, I think, is originally due to, I would say, papers by, by Shamit Kachru and, and Eva Silverstein and collaborators. And you could say, I'm going to again do something what I've done before, and again in different frames and different notation. Why? I really want you to you know, also make contact with the existing literature on the topic. Okay, So I'm following now notation by them, which is then followed a lot in the swamp plant literature. All right? So you remember a few slides ago, let me quickly go there. I made this on sets. Let me show it to you. I did this thing here. We saw it with the front rubing compactification. Remember I said alpha and beta have to be related if I want to go to Einstein frame. And if I don't want to canonically normalize the action, there's a certain value for alpha squared, which I didn't specify. These are all boring details, okay? But now we're doing something similar, but in different frames, okay? So here is a notation. This is 10 dimensional space time metric in string frame. This is supposed to be the four dimensional metric in for the Einstein frame, because I, uh, for the always has to be in Einstein frame because that's, we want to reproduce relativity, right? And this is the internal space of unit volume. So rho, I have a scalar rho and rho is telling me how large my space is. This is my volume scalar. So what is tau? Well. Tau is fixed uniquely by saying that I want to go to Einstein frame in 4D. Turns out if I want to do that, that tau equals rho to the power three over two times e to the minus five. And that is an exercise. It, it should be easy to check this, all right? So the way you check this is you realize, oh, I start off with 10 dimensional Einstein Hilbert, but in front of it is e to the minus two phi. You fill in these ansatz and you need to make sure that this is obeying four-dimensional GR, okay? That I get a four-dimensional einstein Hilbert term. This fixes that guy. So tau is a combination of volume and dilatum, okay? Good. An alternative way of writing it is equally fine. Maybe this is a comment I should not make, but let me make it very quick. People are often confused. Like, but wait, I mean, is this now the four-dimensional metric or is it a vacuum expectation of this guy? Is it this combination that is a four-dimensional metric? Well, it's all a matter of units. What you could do is you, some people, I like to write it like this. 
where tau zero is the value of tau. This means that in the vacuum, this thing drops out. And what is the difference? This is literally the difference between working in 4D Planck units or 10D Planck units. Because if you do this, you can actually check that m Planck squared in four dimensions equals tau zero squared. So you're literally writing the metric in 4D Planck units. Okay. This is a side remark. It's okay if you didn't follow this. It doesn't matter too much. Okay. Now, what is the exercise that I have to do? I have to compute of the different energy densities that I introduced here. You know, the energy density due to the curvature, the fluxes, the sources. I want to compute the way they scale with tau and rho. And this is very easy. Trust me on this. It takes a few lines for each of these. Okay, so what is my notation? H is the energy density due to the from uh, Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz flux. And I get the following scalings. Okay, you see there's specific numbers here, rho to the minus one, tau to the minus two. And for the sources, it is tau to the minus three, rho to the p minus six over two. You remember p was a number like dp, p would be three for a d3 brain. Okay. And what is important is that these three factors they're independent of rho and tau. What is amazing is that these relations are trivial, but they hold for any model. So whatever I conclude now holds for any model. This is why these are powerful constraints. Let me at least quickly give an example how to derive this, and then you understand the trick, okay? So this is 10-dimensional Einstein-Hilbert, e to the minus 2 in string frame. There's e to the minus 2 phi. You should realize that up to derivative terms, R10 splits like R4 plus R6. So this guy clearly becomes a scalar potential, and this becomes my Einstein-Hilbert term. So VR becomes, and you just fill it all in, e to the minus 2 phi, square root of g6, square root of g4, R6. We know that R6 uh, uh, Ricci scalar scales like an inverse metric. So it goes like rho to the minus one. The volume scales like rho to the third. The four dimensional metric, you can just read it off here, scales like t to the, 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 the square root of determinant goes like t to the minus four. You fill it all in and you find rho minus one tau minus two. This is how you do the trick. And you can do it for all the other guys and you reproduce those equations. Okay, now, this is the exercise. This is where I wanted to end because now everything is trivial. If you write out the equation d rho v equals zero, and you write down the equation d tau v equals zero, these are necessary conditions. They're not sufficient to get a vacuum, but they're necessary. My claim is that you get on the nose these equations that I derived before using 10 dimensional equations of motion. Okay, so this is great. I went to page 12 and then next lecture, I really start using this for the swamp and program. Okay, so I would like to ask, it might have been gonna be quick uh, at the end. Uh, so if there are questions, please uh, go ahead. Um, Thank you very much. Great talk, yes. There is one question, please. Yeah. You can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Now I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question with regard to the <clears throat> Dilaton's equations of motion. Equation of motion. Uh, yeah. Does it have a, a, for p not equal to zero? Does it have a consistent phi equal constant solution? Uh, well, see. For p not equal to three, it's, sorry, it's for p not equal to three, not not zero, not p not equal to three. I, I ah, for the three brains. Yes, that's uh, the easiest. So in fact, I, what I'm saying is yeah. that is uh, is there a consistent phi equal constant solution for the case of p not equal to three? Yeah. So the, the situation is actually funny. It's exactly the case p equal to three is where a constant dilaton is the easiest to get because you see. For p equal to three, the brain is not sourcing the dilaton, right? So maybe not sure how familiar you are with d brains. If you look at the supergravity solution corresponding to a d three brain, that's exactly the one where the dilaton is constant throughout the whole brain solution, right? 
Yeah. So it's a good comment. So the problem actually really is if you're very careful, whenever I use a brain that is not a three brain, the dilaton is in fact running inside the extra dimensions, right? And this is why I was like, I was a bit quick, but I was trying to say, look, my argument goes through if that happens because I integrate a box and a box integrated is zero uh, on a compact space because there's no boundary on a compact space. But it's a good comment, so yes, but in fact, for Pico 3, it's the easiest to make it a constant. For the others, it cannot be constant. No. Uh, but all this argument, all the following argument uh, only holds for the case of P equal to 3, no. 3 brain. No. Yes? No, 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 no. It holds for all Is brains. It isn't correct? No, no, no. It holds for all brains, what I've said. P is any value here. Well, any value larger than three, three or larger than three, because I specifically do compactifications to four dimensions. So I cannot use a two brain, right? Because a two brain would uh, not correspond to a vacuum, right? Uh, because I, yes. I need to be able to fill all my space time dimensions, all my 4D space time dimensions. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? At the moment, I, I see no more questions. So thank you. Thank you very much for this. Oh, there is one question. So ah, that is OK. Yeah. Excuse me. So. Uh, my question is a little bit fun and basic. So why is the integral of delta of sigma over the compact manifold one? Because I mean, sigma, where is sigma? Sigma covers the uh, non-compact fault. Ah, uh, good point. Page. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. So I was a bit sketchy here. So I was doing six dimensional integrals over the, right? So I made this comment that I was a bit quick. So when I integrate this over the compact space, what I get is a constant number, which corresponds to the volume of the submanifold wrapped by the brain. So it's not exactly one. I was a bit quick there. You get a numerical factor, which corresponds to the volume of the, of the submanifold wrapped by the brain. Important thing is that you get rid of the delta function. It becomes a constant after integration. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay. No more questions. So thank you for this great talk. We're looking forward to hearing the rest in tomorrow. Okay. Um, Perfect. My pleasure. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. So we come back bye -bye. in 20 minutes. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>